Uh, uh, Pete, Peter is officially um, um, on the tech level, Master Moody of, uh, of Jeff Smith. Oh, no. Okay. Well, that's good. I <laughs> like that. <laughs> so just, just, you know, just to give you a, a context there. <laughs> Sanchez. So, hey, Peter, say something so we can check your sound. Uh, well, uh, thank you for uh, letting me join uh, uh, today's uh, meeting. And uh, Steve, as always, I appreciate you uh, pointing out my uh, technological deficiencies. <laughs> oh, anytime, anytime. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> you always do. Yes. But, um, um, but hey, everybody, as we get started here, our, uh, our topic is, of course, how to turn net income into wealth. And uh, we're joined with special guest Peter Harness. We'll take a, a second and a minute to uh, um, uh, let Peter introduce himself and give some background and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Peter, I was going to introduce you uh, uh, previously to Greg Moody, so he's he's here in the blue shirt, um, and uh, you've talked to Bob a number of times. Uh, there he is. Bob is over Thank here, you. labeled as my as me. Sorry, Hi, sir. Hey, how are you doing, Peter? Good to see you. I'm sorry, I got a member on the phone, sir. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm gonna mute myself. Yeah, no problem. Should be good. Should be good. So hopefully this will work out well. Except my uh, uh, my control panel seems to have frozen up. So we shall see if it uh, everything functions properly. But anyway, hey Peter, let me uh, uh, let me go ahead and turn it over to you, and we'll introduce some of the other uh, uh, our our team as we go here. But. Uh, Peter, why don't you introduce yourself, give them a little bit of background. I think you and I have been working together for what, 20 years or something like that? Some yep. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, about 20 years. Um, well, again, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for uh, uh, taking time out of your day and uh, giving me a moment to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what it is that I do and um, how I help uh, business owners. Uh, just again, for reference, my name is uh, Peter Harnish. Um, I've been uh, with uh, Northwestern Mutual um, wealth management company uh, as a financial was a wealth management advisor now for the last 28 years. Um, I'm also the <clears throat> estate and business planning specialist um, for our office here locally in Denver um, and have made that a part of my practice and focus um, probably for the last 22 of the 28 years that I've been with Northwestern. Um, I also came from a, a closely held family owned business background. Um, so as I got into the experience necessary to move into that space, um, began to focus on working with uh, you know, with business owners as, as, a, as a part of my overall practice, which probably constitutes 50% of the time of what, I, what it is that I do. Um, uh, as far as uh, organizations out there, there's a whole host of them out there, as you all know. Uh, just turn on the TV and you'll uh, be inundated with financial services commercials. Um, I chose Northwestern. Uh, 28 years ago, I'd like to say through a, a quantitative process that was extremely thorough um, uh, and, and well thought out. And I think in part, I guess it was, uh, in part probably was a little bit dumb luck. Um, a fraternity brother of mine, um, a little bit older than I, was the managing partner in the Denver office and uh, got wind that I wanted to join. And so through that fraternity relationship, uh, um, convinced me that Northwestern was the right place to, to hang my shingle. And I've been very uh, fortunate uh, to have this association for that period of time. Uh, in this industry, as you can, uh, as you can imagine, uh, every other day you pick up the paper and there's a, there's a scandal here, there's a this, there's a that. And, and Northwestern really has done a phenomenal job um, in uh, keeping out of those types of negative situations. I think it's the way they conduct themselves in the marketplace. It's always been much more about uh, taking care of existing clients uh, and less about uh, acquiring new ones. So from an industry perspective, Northwestern was just most recently named again, Miss Fortune's most admired company in this space. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be associated with them. Uh, my practice, just to give you a little bit of overview on that, my practice really is uh, uh, consists of, as a wealth management advisor, uh, consists of um, risk management planning, um, as well as um, asset management and portfolio management planning. Um, so we're really trying to be very holistic um, with respect to how we approach what it is that we do for our clients. Um, 
and really it's, it's predicated on a fact gathering process. Um, so what I try to tell my clients is we don't have a bias towards um, anything that we would necessarily recommend. We try to assess each individual situation um, on its own merits and then make recommendations uh, that are appropriate. And as, as a wealth management advisor, um, I have a fiduciary obligation um, to meet that standard, which is to really provide guidance and counsel first before we make any types of material product recommendations. Um, and so the fact gathering discovery phase are critical to that. Uh, and then from there, obviously, we're creating um, a financial analysis uh, for our clients, whether those are going to be focusing more on the business side of the of the planning uh, continuum um, or for that matter on the personal. And as I know with uh, closely held business owners, sometimes those lines are blurred. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of planning that you're necessarily doing that you might say, well, it's business planning, but also to some degree um, is very much uh, um, also personal planning. Because more often than not, uh, that business that we own and that we run uh, typically tends to be the most valuable asset uh, that we have on our balance sheet. So, um, you know, very adept at sort of straddling those two, uh, <coughs> excuse me, those two planning objectives um, and, and the analysis that we bring to the table, um, you know, really allows us to do that. Uh, I think one of the other hallmarks of our organization, what I've tried to do with our practice here as well, um, and Steve can certainly attest to this, um, and he probably would say there's times when he would like me to call him less um, because he's busy with other things, but what we try to do is very, very proactively, um, you know, meet with our clients regularly. Um, I think too often in this industry, uh, what you're seeing out there is you're doing a plan, you're doing analysis, um, and then you don't hear from your guy for three years um, until the market's way down or the market's way up and, and you, you don't know where they've been or that they've, that they've even been paying attention to your stuff. So one of the things that we try to do and adhere to is a real strict um, you know, discipline of, of meeting with our clients um, on an ongoing basis, really ideally twice a year, so that we make sure that we know what's, what are, what's going on inside the business inside their personal lives. So, you know, that, that in a nutshell is kind of the, uh, the process, the deliverable um, is the analysis. Um, uh, Steve, if you have any thoughts you want to interject, uh, let me know. I've kind of used that as a kind of a break point to, to we'll talk next about sort of what the, what the real deliverables are. Um, but if anybody wants to ask me any questions at this point, or Steve, you want me to uh, address anything that you'd like, I could certainly uh, take a moment to do that. You bet. You bet. Um, you know, Peter, when I tracked you down is, uh, I know we were looking for uh, some executive uh, uh, compensation structures for, uh, as well as key man um, insurance. And uh, a lot of what we were working on doing is creating some deferred income tax strategies as well. Uh, a small business owner, so somebody who's running a half a million to two or $3 million business, what are some of the considerations they have around those areas going back to kind of how we first uh, connected? Sure. I, mean, I think from a risk perspective, um, you know, clearly uh, I, would, I would venture to guess most of you are uh, the key drivers of your businesses. Um, and without you there, uh, the businesses would probably experience some level of financial hardship. And so one of the things that we want to try and do, you know, on that risk side of the equation is to assess, you know, what the fallout would be in the event that you could not come to work for whatever reason. Um, you know, whether that was a catastrophic event, death, or whether that was a, a slightly less than catastrophic event, but it was a disabling event or something to that end. Um, and so the idea of key man coverages um, come into play with the idea that it allows the business to survive uh, the loss of that key employee and or owner. Um, as it relates to key employees that you might have, whether those are instructors, whether those are folks that are handling your financials, um, not only are those people key and might cause disruption to the business that we wanna account for that and, and try to mitigate that risk, but those strategies can then also be good um, tools that we then also uh, implement to help retain those employees, i.e. Um, sort of uh, golden handcuffs, if you will. We've got a key person. He's a key instructor. He's a key rainmaker. Um, I don't want to lose him to a, 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 competitor, a competitor down the street. Um, I don't want to necessarily offer 
um, these particular benefits to everybody in the, in the firm, to the other instructors, what have you. Um, and so there's ways of pinpointing people on a very selective basis so that you're getting the best bang for your buck, but you're also helping to retain those people. Um, we then transfer over to the more traditional accumulation side, Steve, of that conversation, um, which then goes into some of the traditional uh, uh, strategies that we might use, uh, simple IRA, 401k, you know, SEP. Uh, those are all going to be very traditional um, uh, retirement strategies that we can use for not only the owners, but also for those uh, folks that would qualify on a full-time basis as being employees. <clears throat> uh, the challenge sometimes with those is that when you offer those types of plans to one person, you have to offer them to all individuals. Um, and many times that can become cost prohibitive. Uh, and, and in a small business, we're always trying to maximize the utilization of every dollar. And so sometimes those types of plans don't necessarily fit into the fact pattern of the business. And that's where we then go to what's called the non-qualified space. Non-qualified simply meaning that we then operate outside the purview of ERISA regulations, which means for all of you as owners of the business that you do not then need to offer those benefits to everyone. So there is an avenue to be very selective with what you do uh, to maximize that, whether that's for yourself first and foremost, um, and or for anybody else that you uh, deem to be a key person. Um, on, a, on an owner basis, you know, why is that valuable? Well, it's valuable because uh, if you're in year one or two or three of, you know, some of this uh, uh, enhanced success, uh, probably to some degree uh, uh, due to in part to, to Steve and, and his team's tutelage, you might be saying, well, geez, I'm just finally getting to a place where I'm seeing the, uh, the, the fruits of my labor uh, pan out. Uh, while I certainly want to in the future uh, incent and, and reward my employees, I'd like to reward myself first. I'm really taking all the risk. So this is a great avenue and a great strategy to use for you yourselves as owners um, to maximize what the business, which I like to always talk about, what do you want the business to do for you? Well, I want the business to give me current income clearly but you'd also like the business to help create wealth. Um, and as a third part to that strategy, we wanna try and somewhat diversify away from the business since more often than not, it's your most valuable asset. So the non-qualified route, Steve, is a great way to begin to diversify away from uh, the business, create some wealth that is independent of the business, um, initially do it in a manner that uh, would be um, first and foremost beneficial to the owner. Um, and then certainly can be considered for other key employees as well. Yeah. And, and one reason to consider some of these things is to, is to be able to put the money in pre-tax, right? Correct. So, sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, try to use uh, the, you know, try to use the benefits of the business structure uh, if it's applicable uh, to put that money away on a, on a pre-tax basis. Um, pre-tax basis, um, typically the non-qualified planning has a tremendous amount of latitude um, so while it's not, you know, quote unquote, a tax shelter, um, there's a lot of latitude that some of this non-qualified planning allows you uh, to do uh, without the constraints of the typical 401k, SEP, or simple IRA. Uh, those come with a lot of rules and regulations. Um, and to be very blunt, typically the rules and regulations are not in favor of the person that's creating the wealth, which is the business owner. Uh, it tends to be much more slanted uh, to the employees. Um, uh, than it is to the more highly comped business owner. So there's sort of an anti or re re reverse um, discrimination that is occurring, probably unintended to some degree, um, but uh, nevertheless, it's occurring. You bet, you bet. You know, I, I would say, Peter, a number of the, uh, the people in the meeting here, probably from 2018 to 2019, had an increase in their income of Let's say 100,000, 150, sometimes 200, 250,000. When when you have that kind of jump in income, and uh, again, of course, our mission is for everybody to have a 200, 300 thousand dollar jump this year. Uh, what are some of the considerations around making sure one, it just doesn't inflate the lifestyle, and two, that uh, uh, that really some long term wealth is being developed? Sure. Well, I think you know, as with any other as with any other enterprise, we try to 
convey to our clients, business owner or not, um, you know, to run your personal affairs the way you would run your business affairs. So certainly I think the idea of uh, understanding what the business's uh, projections are, understanding what their, what their pro forma looks like over the next 12, 24, 36 months is important for us to understand. And then from there, I think it's important to understand um, you know, what their personal uh, hopes, aspirations, expectations are as well. Uh, and then to begin to lay the foundation for some of these strategies that, we, that, we're, that we're talking about here. Um, one of the things that we do, you know, we try to be very, very clear on is that all the things that I will discuss with a, with a business owner um, sound great. Um, they tend to work, they're very, uh, they, they work very effectively inside their long-term accumulation goals. But one of the other things that we do not want to do is uh, is harm the ability for the business to grow. So we don't want to build out plans that would in any way, you know, shape or form interfere with the long-term success of the business. But the flip side to that is, you know, I've had a lot of business owners where we've had to work really, really hard to not continue to put every dime back into the business. Um, and the concern we have there is that you are, you know, you're not really diversifying away from that one singular asset. So strike the balance between, uh, you know, prudent growth of the business, good stewardship of the business, and also making sure you take care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You know, generally with a martial arts school is, unfortunately, the business itself tends not to have much equity value, right? Is it's, is it's diff it'd be difficult to find a buyer if you find if you find a buyer, it's somebody from within and they, you know, pay you out over five or 10 years and rarely do you actually collect much of what the, uh, uh, you know, as they kill the business, rarely do you collect much of that. So I, I always think it's really important for us to be looking at, you know, real estate, the stock market, other investments, uh, building the income up as much as humanly possible, but then putting money aside to build that kind of stability. Um, and one of the things you and I talked about, uh, uh, Peter, is is the um, uh, commercial real estate, residential mm -hmm. real estate versus some other investments. What what are your thoughts on you know them buying their building, building their building, and how uh, what what's your take on all of that? Sure. So great insight on the on the marketplace, you know, for martial arts, um, and that's a really key element for us to know. So if the the underlying value of the business is relatively low. Steve, to your point, and it's not necessarily there's a real market for that, then certainly the idea of, of, of wealth creation while, while you're generating income and running the business away from the business is become, becomes paramount. Um, I'm, I'm in the investment business, um, and so we're in the equity markets and the fixed income markets. Um, that said, there is no singular strategy that should supersede another one. Um, and I have many, many clients uh, that while they actively work with me in creating wealth uh, through the capital markets, stocks, bonds, things like that, um, we're also encouraging them and we're trying to provide guidance for them to diversify even outside the equity markets into such things as uh, their personal real estate, uh, rental properties, and to your, to your last question, their commercial real estate. Um, and so we are um, very much in favor of a diversified approach. And that diversified approach would include those types of assets as well. Um, as with anything though, those assets need to adhere to the same rules that we apply to what we do for our clients in the traditional um, uh, equity markets. Um, if we've been paying attention at all, we've no we all know um, uh, that the uh, overall equity markets have had a tremendous run over the last, well, really over the last 10 to 12 years, but really over the last uh, 36 to 48 months, 2018 notwithstanding, um, in, the, in, the, in the broader markets. And so while we still have reasonable expectations for a strong year in 2020, um, we would be saying to any of our clients, especially if they were new clients, hey, you're getting in at probably relative highs to the market and that we should plan and expect for probably some market retrenching in the next 12 to 24 months. What I mean by that, what I mean is the markets are valued very, you know, at probably all time highs and we're probably buying in at a very expensive point in the market's history. And we want to be pretty cautious about that. 
that point applies then to any other asset class that we would purchase. And so while I'm certainly in favor of having the business help pay for a commercial piece of real estate, um, we want to make sure that we're making that decision with the same criteria in place. And if, if we've been paying attention, the real, commercial real estate market has done the same. Now, I can't speak to every area of the country. Um, and, to your, and, to your, um, and to your client, Steve, there might be certain uh, areas of the country that have a little bit more of a, a value than others, but we would want to help evaluate that for each client on a case-by-case -case basis. So long-winded way of saying I'm in favor of owning your own building. Uh, don't buy it at a premium. Um, ideal if you can buy it. Um, at a discount um, and buy it sort of what I would say wholesale so you're not buying it through that commercial developer. Um, those would be things we'd want to look for. So you want to apply that same idea of buying value to that asset purchase as you would to anything else. Exactly. And, and, and one of the things I think there's just this misnomer of you'd rather be paying your, you know, paying yourself for, you know, paying a mortgage rather than paying rent. In, in reality, depending upon where the building was located, depending upon the trajectory of the neighborhood, depending upon whether it was usable for any other similar uh, type of business or whether it's you know a single use building, there may or may not be um, a long-term value to the actual uh, building and, and or the property. So I, I, I see a lot of martial arts schools, kind of the, the end all and be all is buy their own building. Uh, Travis, you just built a beautiful building, and, and that's fantastic. Um, but I'm always on the on the fence of, are we getting this wholesale? Is it in a neighborhood that has a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year uh, great growth horizon? Are we um, um, able to do something? You know, if 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 I have a building I have my eye on, and I can thump it and 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 get in when the owner has a heart attack or gets divorced or you know is ready to retire and, and get it get a deal. That's a lot different than I'm being, buying at the top of the market, which probably almost everyone on the, on the call, you know, um, you'd be in the commercial real estate market at the near the top of the market rather than at the bottom of the market. And then especially if you were buying in an area that uh, maybe didn't have fabulous growth uh, potential on a 20, 30 year horizon, you know, by the time you got to the point of, of retirement, it, it, uh, it may in fact be worth, uh, worth less than you paid for it rather than more. I mean, a lot of commercial buildings, you know, somebody's buying it to tear it down and, and build a Taco Bell or something. So you've got to be, got to be aware of all of those different uh, uh, scenarios before just getting excited about that. Well, another, uh, I, would, I would agree. I would agree. I, I, would, I would kind of to take that just one quick step further, Steve. Yeah. Is, Right, you find the right building, you get the right value, you get you're buying at the right price, and you know as a byproduct of that, your business now gets to pay down that 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 uh, uh, that that note. You're getting hopefully then consequently also some level of appreciation. But to your point, I think the last component would be all right. My business and my hard efforts have paid this thing down. I've got a nice asset, but can I then lease this out? Can this then become a portion of my income generation? Um, component of my retirement plan and therefore to your point it has to be in a place where that 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 asset then can be you know monetized again when you close your martial arts location and you're going to lease it out to somebody else and that would have to be a critical consideration um, uh, to that to that decision you bet and, and i was going to add that I, I think we've seen it work both ways where we've seen it work out really well and it's yep. been a positive thing and been an asset and we've seen it work out where people bought property just because they thought that was the be all end all and that was how they were going to retire on their property and it ended up being a very bad decision so you've got to be very careful it, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea nobody's saying that but you guys have really said it well um it's uh it's not the ultimate goal the ultimate goal really is to make sure your business runs really well and that when you yeah. have income spur off then like work with peter to you know make the right decisions about or somebody like Peter to, to make the right decisions or have some good advice about putting that money in the right place. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Evaluate it like you would evaluate any other purchase. I think sometimes the, the, the romance around real estate um, clouds that decision a little bit. Um, like I said, you can write it down. I'm a huge believer in uh, commercial and, and rental properties. If you can find the right asset, they're great things to have, but you have to look at them uh, in a, through the same lens that you do uh, the rest of uh, or any other investment that you would make.
Yeah. Now, now it, in, in talking about the capital markets, meaning the stock market, the bond market, et cetera, um, you know, you, none of us are fortune tellers, so we don't have the crystal ball. And, and there's been a big run up. There may, there may well continue to be a big run up. There, 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 there may not be. But I always think that the, uh, uh, a great way to think about those markets, uh, Peter, is on, on time horizon, right? If I had, if I had 100000 in the bank and I need to use that in, in 18 months for, uh, uh, let's say, for my daughter's education since I'm paying uh, college tuition bills now, um, you know, I don't want that, um, uh, or at least the, the bulk of that money somewhere that's, that's at risk, right? On the other hand, if I'm, you know, if I'm in my 40s or uh, uh, whatnot, and, and I'm trying to build as much wealth as possible, I have a long time horizon. And, you know, what we know is all, all you have to do is look at any long-term graph of the uh, capital markets. And we know on the long-term basis, uh, it, it's always going up and beating real estate and beating most everything uh, on the long-term horizon. It just uh, you, you never quite know where it's going to be in 18 months, 24 months, uh, what the short-term fluctuation. Why, why don't you speak to that a little bit, Peter, on, on that? Sure. So, I mean, you said it very well, Steve. I mean, really, we, we look at, we look at, um, we look at uh, things such as uh, capacity to save, uh, in other words, what's the ability of the individual you know, to save, what is that time horizon to save, um, and then what do they view themselves from the standpoint of a risk tolerance? So, you know, how, how, how aggressive or conservative do they view themselves? The truth of the matter is, um, uh, and I'm not trying to take uh, the wind out of my own sails here to all of you on the call, but the two most important components of that equation are capacity to save and the length of time that you have. So time is a critical element to that. Steve, to your point, um, we, we want to always make sure that we pair um, P-A-I-R, pair the um, objective uh, with the time. Uh, in other words, to your point, as we compress time and shorten, shorten that duration, the markets can become very unpredictable. Um, and as they become more and more unpredictable, um, and or some folks will use more, they'll use words like volatile or risky, um, but they become somewhat more unpredictable, um, we have to adjust uh, the type of investments that the clients are in. And to your point, Steve, you do reach a point where the amount of risk that you're taking for that effective, uh, you know, return or rate of return, um, it becomes negligible. So uh, those are elements we have to assess as we create an asset allocation strategy. Um, my view is to, for clients is anything under really 24 months, you know, look for a high yield cash strategy, you know, Capital One, some of those outfits have a lot of these different things available to you. And the truth of the matter is that's about as good as it's going to get. At three to four years, we can begin to create some laddered strategies that are, have some defensive properties associated with them. So we reduce volatility in the industry. We call it beta, B-E-T-A, beta, which is a measurement of risk. Um, and so we can start to mitigate some of that beta at about three to four years. Um, and then really after we get out to that time horizon of five, we can begin to start operating in a more you know, normalized environment and then begin to make just decisions based on what those objectives are. But time is one of the most uh, critical elements to any investment and time or lack thereof is truthfully what creates uncertainty or risk in a portfolio. Because as Steve, as you pointed out very eloquently, when you get to a place where you uh, look at 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the market's actually become extremely predictable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you, you just hit one of my, uh, to, to, to steal from the, uh, the worst case scenario of our colleges, one of my trigger words, be be the beta triggers me back to the uh, worst finance class I had in the master's uh, uh, program with the most uh, belligerent professor I, I have yet encountered. <laughs> so so yeah. it, it, it immediately puts me in, 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 uh, in a state there. But, um, um, but I, I, again, all, all, all that is is a function of what the, what the projected volatility would be of any particular stock or any particular uh, company. So uh, it, it's, it's one of those uh, things in, in an overall portfolio to be aware of. Let, let, let's, let, let's take a pause and, and uh, ask anybody for very specific or general questions uh, so far on this.
Peter, sometimes it takes a while to get them going here. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, everybody should have some questions about, you know, what for their specific situation. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, um, maybe to fill a little bit of time here, Peter, one of the things that I always recommend to anyone who's having a big jump in their, their income is that they've got to set aside and take money off the top and get it out of their business and into other um, 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 potentially lucrative investments. But they certainly got to get it out of their primary business. I'm as bad a, a, as, as anybody else in extra money comes in, you reinvest in your business, more extra money comes in, you reinvest in your business. And sometimes that reinvestment is useful. A lot of times it's, you, you know, you have 40,000 sitting there and it seems like it'd be nice to recarpet or repaint or, or build some walls or tear down some walls, the, the things that probably wouldn't be ne necessary or useful if you didn't have extra cash flow. Um, but one of the, um, um, the important things I think is neither you nor I, Peter, are, are, are telling people to, you know, live amongst lifestyle. We both have the affliction of being uh, Porsche Turbo fa fanatics. That's, that's so, correct. So um, 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 we, we, we both have the Porsche Turbo and we both have the affliction of being uh, um, um, happy with, excited about, and mul owner of multiple frivolous, <laughs> uh, ridiculously priced watches uh, that, that keep slightly worse time than uh, an <laughs> A good but, Seiko or a Casio. Yeah, yeah, you know, or or the uh, the the jour, the, uh, uh, the 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 I uh, I watch or whatever it's called. The um, uh, but but you you want to be taking money off the top in your business and putting it aside to create that level of stability. You know, we have an interesting industry where I don't think most people on the on the meeting are really thinking in terms of like retiring from a standpoint of. I get to be 65 and I walk away from the business. Um, you know, my, my version of retirement is let me keep whittling away the stuff that I don't like about the business and, and hiring for that and, and putting myself in a role of doing the things that I like about the business. Um, and again, there's not, we're not in a, bi a business where there's a big payday. So I'm not going to build this business for 20 years and then somebody's going to cut me a check for $5 million for it. So it really has to be, we're putting money aside and we're also dealing with the, uh, the risk factors. Um, so it is something for everybody to be thinking about is, you know, taking 20% off the top, 25% off the top and making sure it's going into, you know, not going into a savings account attached to the business where you're going to be tempted to pull it back in, but it's going off the table where it stays off the table and really goes into, into wealth. And that's, that's again, the, the mistake people make is they, they, they put it in a separate account and it's not really off the table because then they transfer it back in the business and, and make a, uh, uh, investments in the business that wouldn't be necessary. So, yeah, I mean, I, and, and all that stuff is, is, is spot on. I think that the, the, what we would want to help any potential client do is one, understand the business, two, therefore understand their cash flow model, understand what sort of their um, liquidity needs are. Uh, these are the peak months. These are the slow months. This is what I've got coming out for a capital outlay. To your point, at some point, I got I do have to replace the replace these mats. I have to replace this lighting system and create a strategy around that. I mean, I think that uh, long term investing. Uh, one of the biggest uh, pitfalls that we have is that we're not prepared to be long term investors. To your point, Steve, these monies, these dollars become fungible and they sort of travel between accounts. We want to say, look, here's your operating capital. Um, you know, here's your line of credit, potentially. Uh, develop a good relationship with your banker. And, and these two things now become the, the bulkhead for your business. You've got plenty of cash in the bank. You've got a line of credit if things get, you know, tricky or if you need to do something unexpected, you can access those things. Use those things with discipline. Now, to your point, Steve, now let's start with confidence taking 10, 20% off the top for this long-term savings. Um, but we have to build the platform or the strategy out correctly. Um, and if we don't, then you, you find yourself with what, what you know, too many Americans do, which is over 55% of 401ks have loans out against them. Well, that's because it's the classic thing to do, which is put money in my 401k, get my match, put my money in my 401k, but there's no savings set aside. We have an emergency. 
um, husband or wife loses a job, and next thing you know, we're dipping into the 401k. And so the, the flaw to that strategy was not to put the money in the 401k, but it wasn't to build out some of those other fundamentals first. And those are critical. And so some of the work that we do will not necessarily um, um, have funds or transactions, uh, you know, uh, earmarked for us initially. They, they might be as simple as some of the things we said, building out those emergency funds, developing that rapport with the bank or building out the line of credit, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll try and help with those things. So. Yeah. And, and, and again, kind of not to get too technical, but when you're, when you're putting money in the market, one of the things that I've always felt was, was a, a good way to look at it is dollar cost averaging. So if you're putting, yes. if you're putting money into the market, in, into this every two weeks, every month, uh, let's say on a monthly basis, and you've just disciplined yourself to, you know, 20% off the top or 10% off the top, and it's going into these investments. Now what you have, as you, as, 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 as you mentioned, you know, the market may go up this, this, you know, this month, it may go down next month, it bounces back and forth. But if you're just putting a, a consistent amount in every month, it's gonna average out those fluctuations. So you, you don't have to worry about that. And I see, I see a, a, a lot of people, I think, try to let me go save until I hit whatever the number is, you know, $200,000, and then I'll worry about investing that. And that always seems like a backwards approach. You invest what you've got, but then you get regular off the top, where every month, you know, as, as, as sure. I've done with you for 20 years, is, you know, I, we, we know that, you know, maybe 10,000 off the top is gonna, is gonna yep. go into different um, um, uh, investments. And, and then we're going to review strategy and make sure it's going places that uh, are going to accomplish the goals we want to accomplish. I, I agreed. So, yeah, and, and, and I appreciate you pointing that out. I mean, at the ult ultimately, uh, to your point, being systematic, and I apologize, I'm no longer in the screen because my phone, <laughs> the battery seems to be uh, dying rapidly here. So I've had to put okay. it on the ground. I had to put it on the charger. So my apologies. Yeah. Um, but you're right, Steve. I mean, the systematic approach, a uh, disciplined approach um, is critical. I, I, I know very, very little, though you and I have been friends for a long time, I know very little about martial arts, um, uh, but I, I do know enough to know that there's a, a significant amount of discipline required uh, to achieve and, and to master, um, you know, the, the, the various disciplines. And uh, I, I try to adhere to that when it comes to the business of helping our clients be successful, I try to be very, we try to be very clinical. We try to be very antiseptic. And we try to be very, very disciplined, um, and we try to be very unemotional um, about it. Uh, and all of those things uh, are easy for me to do because I'm German. Um, and so, uh, you know, as my wife says, sometimes I lack empathy and uh, a lot of other things. But but we we try to adhere to a real disciplined approach. And, and to your point, Steve, being systematic is critical. Absolutely. I think Marty Mark, market timing does not work. Yeah. Market timing Marty, really not. Marty, you don't have to raise your hand. Just start speaking up. That's the way it works. Uh, all right. Everybody um, starts talking. Yeah. So, uh, Peter, um, you talked about the more qualified routes of 401k IRAs, simple IRAs, um, and then you talked about more of the non-qualified -qual routes. <laughs> Could you go into more detail about that? What do you sure, mean by so the non-qualified routes? Well, so, so just to, to create the baseline, Marty, qualified um, is going to be um, anything that has, has, you know, really has a risk or, right, employee law associated with it. Um, and those are things um, that have been created, you know, through Congress and through various, you know, uh, tax acts. Um, obviously, the one that's probably the most, you know, famous or most well-known would be the 401k. Um, so you've got a 401k. Um, you've got sort of the more simplified version of the 401k, which um, is the simple IRA. Um, and then you've got the, you know, the SEP IRA, which is going to be that self-employed pension strategy. And then you have obviously the traditional um, IRA. And then you also have what's called the Roth IRA. Um, and any and all of those are going to fall under the guidelines of some, um, you know, IRS regulations. And with regulations, uh, you get limitations and you have to adhere to those regulations. So those are, and they're all, by the way, they're all, these are all wonderful strategies to employ, but when you employ them inside the business, 
uh, the point of the matter is what you do for yourself, Marty, is what you will have to then do on some basis for everyone else. And so there's a lot of strings attached to that. And sometimes it's not that easy to say what I'm going to do for myself and or for my key person I want to do for everybody else. Because sometimes those other employees may not be as valuable to you um, and or as, as necessary to you. And so therefore, uh, any of these um, qualified plans sometimes um, require a lot more money. Um, they require uniform participation amongst all employees that are considered full time. And so they tend to be a little more difficult to uh, execute on. The non-qualified space is a place, is a, is a, are strategies that operate outside the confines of um, these IRS regulations. And there's still some regulations associated with them, but they do not fall under ERISA. And so therefore, uh, since they do not fall under ERISA, you do not have some of the same constraints around uh, making it available to all your employees. So you can be selective. You could do it for yourself. You could just simply do it for yourself and a key employee. Um, and those non-qualified strategies can look very much like the qualified strategies. So you can buy stocks, you can buy mutual funds, you can buy annuities, you can buy life insurance, you can buy every, anything that you can think of that you might buy inside your 401k or your simple IRA can be purchased through the non-qualified strategies as well. But with the non-qualified strategies, you're also allowed to do some other more enhanced things to them, specifically around employees, you can create some retention strategies, right? So vesting um, inside non-qualified plans, the person that gets to determine the vesting schedule is you. You do not have to um, adhere to any IRS schedule or any regulations. You're literally able to create a plan, if it's for your employee, that literally is created by you for, for that employee to meet not only their objectives, but yours as well. To Steve's point earlier, hey, you know, I really can't ever sell this thing for a lot of money. I doubt my employees would ever want to buy it for any amount of money. But my goodness, you know, these two key instructors, if I can keep them for another 10 years, I can make a lot of money doing this and I want to incent them to stay right? They don't ever want to buy my business from me, but I know they'd love to make a lot of money running my business for me. And so therefore, I'm going to create a non-qualified strategy where I put money away for them on a pre-tax, tax preferred basis, but they don't get the money on something. I'm, I'm very much glossing this over, but they don't get the money um, for five or 10 years. Well, why? Because that matches the strategy that I have uh, to with my exit to the business. So not the non-qualified space allows for an enormous amount of customization to meet your objectives. And, and then and from there, go ahead. I, I was going to say, to pick up on something you said a minute ago, just to interject, or if you have that key full-timer who may in fact want to buy the business, but they don't have independently assets, you could build the, the savings plan for them, yes. where that money would be there in 5, 10, 15 years. Right. Excellent uh, points. So yeah. in that space, you could use it. Yes, 100%. So if that employee does have aspirations to do it, you can effectively help them to get there. Yes, you are effectively helping them create the down payment uh, for the business. You're creating, helping them to create the market. But effectively, you could provide a pathway for them to, you know, to do that. And, and at the end of the day, the, you would hope that the numbers would still benefit you long term. But yes, great point. Great point. Yeah. So how do you do this? You know, I understood that when you explained earlier, but how do you actually do this? Um, well, I mean, so from a, from a process perspective, obviously, uh, to, to, I think to try to answer your question, uh, the two of us would, I, we would, we would, you know, on some basis we would meet, we would, we would start to lay out the criteria that you have around whatever your objectives are, Marty, whether that's for you personally or for you and or employees. Um, so I would get the data points from you, right? So you would say, look, this is what my objectives are. It's, it's for myself and it's, I wanna, I wanna do this, this, and this. My goal is to accumulate this much money. Um, we would try to get a better understanding of what your corporate structure is. Are you an LLC? Are you an S corp? Do you have a C corp? Do you own, do you own uh, you know, real estate? Uh, do you have a separate holding company? So we'd understand what the corporate structure is. And then we would go about building the solution for you uh, to meet those objectives. So it's really as simple as that. Um, but the first step would be to understand what the objectives are to build out sort of the, 
the straw man around the, the non-qualified plan. And then from there, once we've done that to your satisfaction, then we're looking at the, 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 right, the boots on the ground. What's the actual strategy we're going to use or implement to, 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 to satisfy those, those, those objectives, if that makes sense. Did I answer your question? Um, a, a little bit. Um, well, sorry, that's a, I don't want to take up all your time. It, uh, well, it requires, it requires more discussion, I think, yes. is part of it, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's the same way we'd evaluate, you know, you can say, well, I want a retirement plan for my employees. Okay, well, what's your payroll? What are your objectives? You know, do you want a vesting schedule? Do you not want a vesting schedule? Um, you know, how much would you like to match? Do you want to be on the hook to match that? Do you want that match to be subjective? In other words, more of a profit share. So yeah, with any and all of these strategies, it's important to then understand what the objectives of the owner are and then you're tasking me to come back with, I'm, Marty, I guess I'm putting it the other way. Once I understand what your objectives are, I would build the recommendation for you and then present to you what that solution would look like. Yeah. And, and, and all of this is perfectly legal, right? I mean, you're not talking about going around the law, are you? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. So okay. non-qualified planning is used in corporate America all the time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, and and, 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 and and Marty, one of the, uh, uh, which Peter, as, as I've worked with you more closely, uh, exasperatingly so, is uh, a company like Northwest Mutual is uh, um, massively focused on dotting every I, crossing every T, and and um, um, making sure that there, there is no gray area. So, a absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, but, but uh, Marty, maybe to answer your question more thoroughly is, you know, on any one of these things, you know, we could have a conversation that would go 10 hours about how to dot the I's, cross the T's, yeah. specific. But for each individual, uh, I mean, that's what Peter does for, for a living is it would be set a time. He can go through your existing needs. Um, and opportunities, go through what you're trying to accomplish specifically, uh, perhaps come up with a, a, a few opportunities that you haven't thought about, and then go through it specifically. It's not, it, it is, it's not something that could be templated for everybody on the meeting, in other words, right? Yeah. And, and the process of setting up, whether it's a non-qualified plan, a qualified plan, uh, the retirement plans, and, the, you know, and some of the risk mitigation insurance strategies, are going to be very personalized, so it really would require uh, a one-on-one, -on -one, um, as with anything in this case, giving him as much information as humanly possible about your current situation, um, letting him go back to, you know, his own expertise or other exp people of expertise within the organization to put it together for you and then structure it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Was that sure. a good description, yeah. Peter? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. In a nutshell, Marty, we customize everything um, and we understand what the variables are for you. And given the variables and given the, the data points that you give us, then we, we customize, you know, the strategy for you, uh, you know, given those data points. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And, and again, the, the, the reason well, we're having this meeting and the reason I'm going to beat it to death quite a bit is you know, we're, we're, we're being very successful, at least with a, a, a good number of people, with having six-figure-plus annual increases in net income, right? But what I don't want to see is anybody five years from now, it's all been spent, it's all been invested back in the business, and you don't have, you know, a million, two million, five million in assets of money that, that should have come off the top and, and be focused appropriately, Right. Yeah, and it's not hard to have a million in assets if it's $100,000 a year for 10 years. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, and Master Oliver, if I could say something, one thing that I hear from, from Peter, which is different from you hear from a lot of financial advisors, is the understanding of, uh, of the, the overall business. You know, a lot of these uh, people you talk to are just do, don't understand what we go through as business owners. So you need to have uh, somebody with his expertise uh, you know, or at least go through this kind of discussion because that's beyond the scope of the average, I would say. Would that be fair to say? I mean, Master Oliver, you talked to a lot of people, but Peter, I think you've talked to, you know, kind of the industry as well. 
Um, and uh, that's important considerations because you're not just investing money. You've got investments related to the scope of what you're doing as a business owner. Yeah, I think my, my, my unique background, having grown up in a, in a closely held business, my father owned a large uh, in-flight catering company in, in Houston, Texas, is you know, I've gained an appreciation for, one, how important the business is to all of you. Uh, you're obviously devoting a lot of time um, uh, with, with, with Steve and his team uh, around, you know, improving your business. So, so the business is, a, is, a, is, is, is important to you. Um, and we want to build that plan, uh, that outside investment uh, component um, in conjunction with, you know, meeting the needs of the business. Um, so, yeah, we try to strike a balance there. Uh, continue to grow the business, continue to meet the ongoing financial objectives of the business while still making sure you take care of yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had a Go question. Ahead, uh, I'm just curious about, like, if I have some long-term debts, uh, like a personal house, you know, four and a half percent interest, is that one of those things? I mean, should I be hustling to pay that down or is it, would it be more prudent to be putting it away into that 401k and, and getting a, hopefully a little better return over the long term? Yeah. Great question. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Your name was again. Uh, Will. Will Caldwell. Will. Hi, Will. Um, so great question. So the sh you, you kind of answered it yourself a little bit there, right? When you pay down the mortgage, which certainly can be part of a conservative strategy. So I'm not saying it's a, it's an awful idea, but, my view to that would be why would we be why would we be paying down a four and a half percent asset you're getting some tax deductions off of it you're getting some interest rate interest deductions why would we not want to take that same amount of money um, and look for an opportunity to get eight to ten percent eleven percent right I mean again the markets are going to be um, there's gonna be some level of volatility on the short term but to Steve's point long term right we know know that the broader equity markets are going to do nine to 10 percent it's just a fact so would we rather have our money growing at nine to ten percent or growing at four and a half percent well the short answer is we'd rather have it growing at nine to ten percent so you know again though because i do try to take a balanced approach you know what we do with a lot of our clients will say look i know you'd like to maybe pay the house off a little bit sooner you know first question you're gonna live in that house the rest of your life no well then don't do it you live in that house the rest of your life, maybe. Well, then maybe let's take a little bit of money and put it towards it. Is this my forever home? Then let's take, you know, let's make an extra two or three payments a year so that we sort of satisfy that more conservative side of the strategy while still balancing and offsetting it with the more aggressive side of the strategy, the 401k, right? The tax deduction, the match, and all those kinds of things. So I think a balanced approach is a great, is a, is a great idea. But certainly if it was, I have a dollar and where should I put it? I would certainly put it in the equity markets versus putting it uh, towards extra uh, to my to my mortgage um, yeah. is, a, is a fundamental part of my strategy okay thank you of course yeah, my yeah and, and will don't miss the point that um, when you're um, uh, looking at the uh, the mortgage interest that that mortgage interest is deductible too I mean that, that you know some of the tax laws changed a little bit but uh, but once you have the interest being deductible, that again, it's, you're not really paying four and a half percent if you're if you're able to do a tax deduction on the interest. Okay, yeah, that's so it's you're saving even more money, and you know, I guess the other way of putting it, Will, is if I came to you and said, "Hey, Will, look what a great job I did for you last year. I got you three percent in your in your mutual funds with me." My general view would be you probably would be disappointed with me if there were reasons. <laughs> why I should have done a lot better, right? Fair? Sure, yes. Yep, but yet that's the strategy you'd be employing by, by you know, sort of really aggressively paying down that mortgage. So, right, that's, that's why we would say, you know, go the other direction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good, other questions? Good question, Will. Yeah. Going once. Easy, Easy enough. Uh, Peter, if, if somebody wanted to follow up with you on more personalized uh, uh, questions, uh, what would be their next step? Uh, sure, I can, um, Stephen, I can send you my 
uh, send you an email with my uh, uh, contact information at the bottom of it. Uh, and then um, you can certainly forward it on to them. Um, uh, if they want, they can certainly take down information. We want me to give it to you verbally now. Sure. Um, so uh, my email address is my first name, Peter dot H A R N I S C as in Charlie H at two letters N as in Nancy M as in Mary dot com. So Peter dot harnish at NM dot com. Phone number cell is always the best place to reach me. 303 Four seven eight eight nine three three. You know something we didn't talk about, um, and, and well, you, you well and, just, and just to be clear, you do work with people all across the country, not just in Colorado. Oh yeah, yes, yes. So I've got clients. Uh, geez, New York, Boston, Chicago, uh, California, Texas, Arizona. I mean, and parts in between, Kansas City. Sure. Yeah, and I, I, I have no I have no limitations from a licensing perspective, so I'm free to work uh, throughout the United States. Yeah, and we and we have some people on here from Canada and the UK, so so that's probably out of your purview. Unfortunately, those are. Yeah. Um, always happy to uh, 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 dispense any thoughts, advice if they would like to chat with me, but they would then have to engage. Um, you know, a representative in their own country to do those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, something that you mentioned earlier, and I, I, I meant to um, 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 have you expand on it. We, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. We've had this happen three or four times. Um, uh, one scenario, David Moss in, uh, in Northern Virginia, um, he had a back injury related to his level of uh, achievement and the extreme performance in martial arts it probably sounds familiar to a lot of you. And he had to go in and have back surgery. Uh, they were expecting him to be out for one to two weeks on the back surgery. Turned out he was out for four months and really unable to run the business at all uh, for those four. And it, 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 it kind of exacerbated itself into, into six or eight months. One of the things that I was interested in early on was disability insurance and life insurance. Obviously, life in part because I have kids that I don't want them to be dependent upon an income stream coming from the business, but also the disability. If, uh, As you mentioned, with most people on the meeting, uh, as was the case with David, if I'm unable to, to, to work for six months, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm worried about whether the business is still here when I get back, right? So... Um, talk to that briefly about um, um, the way that you look at it and the way they should, would, should think about those areas. Sure. So I think first and foremost, uh, as, we, as we meet with an individual business owner, uh, again, we, get an assess we make an assessment of um, uh, the, val the value that they provide to the business um, and walk them through what would happen if they were no longer able to work in the business. Uh, from there, uh, we would uh, uh, try to identify any key people that were a part of the business or any strategic relationships they might have outside of their own business, maybe with an instructor or with another business owner, you know, down the street. The idea is we need to assess what happens if you can't go to work. Um, from there, then we begin to, Steve, to your point, begin to try to craft um, the appropriate risk solutions to then um, build out that contingency plan. Um, so to be specific, let's just say, Steve, you and I are, we're friendly competitors, we're good friends. I run my, um, my school you know, uh, down here in Denver, you run yours up in Evergreen, uh, but we've got a great relationship. We've been friends for a long time. Um, and we both agree that if something ever happened to me, uh, you would provide me with some level of support. In that case, I would want to make sure that I could um, have some sort of key man disability on myself. Idea being that uh, that key man disability would then allow me through the firm to pay for Steve and our arrangement for him to take care of my, uh, my school for some period of time and be compensated. 
I would also have individual disability, which that would allow me to be paid to myself um, for the income that I would be losing by not being able to be at the business. So, right, the strategy um, would uh, become uh, more, uh, you know, flushed out uh, through those types of conversations. Uh, but we would certainly try to look at how do we protect the business so that the business is still there when I get back to it. And then how do I protect myself financially so that in the interim, um, I can still pay my bills. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, that's one of those conversations anybody could have with you individually. Um, it, and if, by the way, Steve, it appears that my uh, attempts to charge my phone on my little, uh, in, 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 in office, uh, platform while I'm on record here did not work. So I'm down to about 10% just to let you know, I could, uh, it could die here probably the next five minutes, I guess. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, um, I, I was going to say that we do have several people in the, on the meeting here that have um, um, uh, family um, uh, members who are part of the business as well. And an mm -hmm. awful lot of this would be relevant to that. So uh, Absolutely. Like Amanda, Jan, uh, as to have, you know, sons and daughters uh, actively involved in the business and perhaps transition uh, issues to deal with and so forth. The, the, the bottom line for me, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, Paul. Um, what was the, uh, the area code again for your uh, cell phone? 303. 303? All right. Maybe go ahead and give the whole number again, Peter, if you don't mind. Sure. 303-478-8933. And uh, if we were uh, to give you a call and... Uh, I'll try and set something up. Um, what is, besides what our future plans are uh, and objectives, what would you want us to have prepared for you going into that call? Yeah, great question. I mean, so first and foremost, Paul, you know, what I'd want to do is get to know you. And, and, and again, today's probably phone call has probably served to do a lot of that for you. But um, we'd want to get an overall kind of snapshot of who you are and what your objectives are to that end. You know, if you've got a personal balance sheet, uh, if you've got a sort of a business balance sheet, you know, profit and loss, just some of the general uh, framework around, you know, what does my personal finances look like? What do my corporate business finances look like? Um, and then uh, just a general overview of kind of what you have, i.e., um, you know, I own my own home. Here's what it's worth. Here's the interest rate on it. Here's what the liability on it is. You know, to Steve's point earlier, do I own my own building? Do I not? So those types of financial things would be important to understand. Do I have any outside investment accounts that might be sitting in old 401ks or IRAs? Those types of things would be very helpful to us. Um, and then and really from there, then it would be, a, you know, about a 45 minute to an hour conversation around the framework of those goals and objectives. But those would all be things that if we had them, at least at the time of the meeting, uh, they would then be helpful. Great, great. thanks. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I, I'm po uh, posting your uh, contact information in our Facebook group as well right now, Peter. Okay, great. And a reminder to everybody, the recording uh, will be up in the member site too, so they can go back and listen to this. Merrick should have it up there. The thing I would leave everybody with is that, you know, part of what I do for a living, much like, you know, how these gentlemen help coach you uh, through the evolution of your, your own, your individual schools is for me, it's, a, it's I enjoy the process. Um, and so it's always great to meet new people. It's great to hear about what they do for a living. Um, it's great to understand what in your individual um, opportunities and challenges are. Um, in the, in the fact of the matter is I've been doing this for 28 years and Steve can attest to, um, you know, We'll always be very direct with you. We'll tell you what we think it is you need to do. But, you know, at the end of the day, these are your goals and objectives. So we'll certainly work on your timetable. Um, uh, and the, the most important thing you can do, whether you use me or someone else, is, is to start the process. Because uh, Steve really is, is raising some great points and, uh, um, uh, you know, really has everybody's best interest at heart um, by, by trying to emphasize some of these planning objectives. Yeah, so we want them to buy some toys, but also end up wealthy here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer, as you know, Steve, in doing both. Uh, you know, life is short. We don't know when that uh, 
ticket gets punched. So I'm a big believer in doing both sides of the equation. Have yeah. fun, but also safe. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, on that note, I guess we'll call it a day unless anybody has any other quick questions uh, before uh, Peter's technology dies on him. Um, and Peter, I'll get I'll get you all set up so you can you can you can you can do these things effectively. It only it only took me two and a half years to get Jeff Smith effective. <laughs> uh, and he, he does it right most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Uh, yeah. He still hasn't learned the it doesn't work while you're driving in the car thing though. No. Okay. Um, um, but um, um, I, I would remind everybody the the Disney trip uh, yeah. is coming up in five or six weeks. Make sure you. You've got everything booked for that. One of the things I was going to uh, point out as we look at the structure, the little link that they gave us for uh, for the trip allows you to buy, uh, uh, I believe, discounted park tickets. But one of the things we want to do when the, with the meeting on Friday, Saturday, is break early on on uh, uh, the first day and let everybody take time in the parks. Marty, you had had a question uh, uh, a week or so ago uh, about this. You can buy a half day ticket, which is good anytime afternoon. And so what I would do is buy a half day ticket for the uh, uh, for Friday. If you're going to do some additional days as well, great. If not, uh, that's up to you. Uh, but I, I, I would get a half day for uh, uh, for Friday. Uh, we're also going to try to set up a Zoom meeting like this with my friend Mike McCoy. He's actually going to be in Thailand. Uh, uh, and he's been back and forth, uh, apparently, to the uh, Disney China, helping them with that one. But um, we're going to set some time with him be behind the scenes on one of these Zoom meetings. And I would remind everybody, we have some tremendously good Disney content in the member site. So if you search it uh, for Disney, you'll find some really good audio recordings of Disney approach to service, the Disney approach to leadership, and a two or three hour segment that we did with, uh, with Mike at a previous meeting as well. Um, on that note, if there's nothing else, we'll call it a day. If there's anything else, we'll, uh, uh, we'll address it real quickly. Peter, thank you so much for uh, all of your contributions to everybody. And again, I, you know, I've worked with you for 20 years. Uh, you're, you're about as, and, and by the way, relative to Northwest Mutual, you're one of the top five that they have in the country out of, um, what, 9,500 people. So, and your specialty is small businesses like this. So, so um, uh, you, you, you'd be the go-to guy for any of our guys. Yeah, thanks for being here, Peter. I, 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 yeah, my, my pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you all for taking the time to uh, uh, let me uh, be a part of your day. I greatly appreciate it and uh, look forward to speaking with you. Thank you, sir. Good. Anybody have anything else before we wrap up? Master Oliver, a quick question on the May meeting. Is that a Thursday, Friday meeting, 14th, 15th? or is it? it is. It is not a typo for a change. So it is Thursday, yeah. Friday. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you asked that because that was we want to make sure everybody's clear on that Thursday, Friday. Yeah, and 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 um, um, over the next few weeks, I'll look at seeing if there's some things we might be able to do in the schools on on uh, on Saturday as well. But yeah, it's going to be on on Thursday, Friday, and it'll be at our uh, our old standby Table Mountain Inn. Perfect. Well, good. Well, thanks everybody, and uh, and by the way, Master Moody, we have um, um, our two um, um, our quick start meeting this weekend. Uh, most of you wouldn't be there anyway, but we won't have the quick start meeting tomorrow. Uh, Bob, if you can re remind me to make sure that uh, Merrick gets that word out and that we that we post that everywhere, we will do our our um, uh, staff development meeting in the morning. Yes, sir, and I won't be on that because I'm traveling. Matt White's to teach a seminar for him. Fantastic! I look forward to it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody. We'll uh, call it a day. Thank Bye, you very, very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks.